Hello, Full Noble crew. How are you guys doing? Um, I'm really, really, really excited to do um, this presentation about this particular topic. Um, you know, we, I, I've actually, this, is, this has been a topic I've been researching, um, honestly, for almost the last six months. And there's a lot um, really to unpack here um, in a lot of different areas. So I'm really excited to share. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about um, how to use BIM as a gateway to increasing diversity in architecture. Uh, so this might seem a little hard to do, and this might seem maybe a little bit left field, but um, I think once I start to get into my background, uh, my company, and what I do, and what I run, um, this will all really start to make a lot of sense. Uh, so obviously there, there's a lot going on. Uh, right now in our country, but honestly, there's really a lot, um, a lot of shifts happening in architecture in basically the the world, and um, you know, architecture, uh, you know, fundamentally, actually has a lot of changes to go through right now, and I think it's important for everyone who's on this conversation to understand what those changes are, so that we can know how to adapt to it. So. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, for those of you who have no idea who I am, uh, my name is Ichano Okara. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Revicaz, and I'll break down what we do in a bit. Um, I went to Temple University. I have a bachelor's in architecture. Um, worked at a couple firms in the in the city uh, before I uh, transitioned into you know doing you know BIM con uh, uh, running projects and being a BIM consultant. Um, my parents are originally from Nigeria, but I was born and raised in um, Jersey City. And, you know, I love to cook, I love to eat, and I love to spend time with my family. I think one of the blessings in disguise of uh, this current pandemic and everything that we're going through, especially being home and social distance, you know, I have a, a three-month-old son that I think I'm so grateful that I have time to spend with him. Um, in a period where, you know, I wouldn't have time to spend with him. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, so, you know, I just got a chance to put him to bed. <laughs> so, you know, if I was doing this, this webinar in person, although I would love to, you know, hug and shake all of you guys' hands, I'm happy that I get a chance to, you know, once it's done, check on him, rock him, and just keep playing with him. So I'm really happy about that. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about what we do. <clears throat> so uh, Revigaz is a BIM consulting firm. Uh, and the first thing we do is we help people transition into the BIM landscape. So if you're not there yet, uh, our job is to you know, help, uh, help to develop templates, standards, workflows. We pretty much dissect you know, how you typically design. And we come up with a plan to you know, transition your whole workflow to Revit. Um, we do a lot of staffing. So, you know, if you have a major deadline coming up or you need like a couple of people who hop in remotely, you know, our, our company is really geared to help um, actually companies of all size. We, you know, we're, we're geared really for small and mid-sized firms, but um, these days a lot of uh, major companies are, are really starting to engage us and um, we're starting to do work across the board. But uh, the goal is to be able to help someone expand and contract their operations at will. So if you need more staff, we can help you. If you need less, whatever. If you just need consulting, we can kind of sort, um, uh, give you whatever support that you need. Um, so we help out on staff and we help out on just overall support. Um, you know, for a lot of projects, we're, we're sort of running a lot of projects from start to finish in terms of um, being BIM managers and uh, making sure that all of the subs and the collaborators are all on the same page. And then the last thing that we do is a ton, a ton of content development. So this is um, everything from developing base building models to developing families or details or anything that needs to get created, Dynamo scripts, um, we could pretty much do it. So, um, so this is just who we are and what we do. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's get into our topic. Um, and, Oh man, this is this is a, a, a really great topic. Um, the, the way I want to kind of structure today, you know, I'm gonna really kind of talk about the state of um, diversity and architecture today, just where it's at. 
Um, but then we're also going to talk about where some of the changes that are happening in the country. This, this is really um, a presentation that that's not what you think. It's because there's diversity um, that we need to address on two ends. There's racial diversity, which is the obvious one, but there's also technological diversity. Um, you know, one of the things that I, you know, uh, at the start of this presentation, what I really wanted to say <laughs> is that the, the state architecture as a profession is in a bunch of trouble. And, um, you know, there, there's some major shifts happening in the world and in the building design industry that, um, you know, architecture would have to make some significant changes to be able to catch up to. So diversity isn't necessarily a, um, you know, we, you know, it, it, it's not like, a, hey, I, I wish they would open the door. This is actually a, they have to open the door or this profession won't exist anymore. And I need to help you guys understand why that is. So let's get started. Now, the first thing um, that you guys have to understand that America's changing dramatically. <laughs> the face of ownership in America is going to be drastically different in the next 25 years, all right? The, the census predicts that the US will be majority white. I'm sorry, minority white, that's a typo. Uh, minority white by 2045. So that percentage is supposed to be like uh, uh, white people in America is around 49%. Um, I think right now it's um, somewhere in the ballpark of around 60 to 70%. Um, that, is, that number is supposed to, um, expect it to significantly drop in the next 25 years um, with, I believe, Hispanics being the, the um, you know, the second big, the second largest demographic uh, within the United States. So um, overall right now, um, that the face of people and ownership in the country is dramatically changing. And this is important too, because if you can imagine uh, right now, something that's a little crazy is that, um, you know, currently the architecture industry is 90% white people and 79% of them are guys. So this is tough because if I'm an owner and I need a hospital built, I'm probably going to look for, and, and it's a hospital going in, you know, maybe a, a section where I'm from, um, maybe in Jersey City because, you know, I want to redevelop that neighborhood. I'm probably going to look for someone who shares my views and perspectives to be able to develop that uh, project for me. Okay. So um, the industry has a long way to go to be able to catch up and be able to adapt to what the owners of the future are going to be expecting, okay? So there's, um, there's a, so the, the diversity piece is actually super important because it's gonna be really hard for a major, the majority of firms to stay relevant. Now, um, there's a couple barriers that are in place to, you know, sort of get into architecture and you know, um, my background is in architecture. It's so funny. Um, I had no idea that architecture existed um, until my senior year of, of uh, college, so, uh, f a senior year of high school, and um, well, probably senior year of college too, but, <laughs> but senior year of high school. And, you know, my, my parents, are, like, so if I could just tell you the quick story, right? My parents are from Nigeria. They emigrated to this country with absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, I'm the youngest of six, so, and my brothers and sisters came over when I was like four or five years old, and, but I was born here. Um, and my talent growing up was, I, I was really good in art. I was trained in fine art. I took classes on Saturdays at Cooper Union uh, up in New York, um, and I, uh, up there I did fine art and printmaking. And so when I was a junior in, in high school, wanting to go to college, and my parents asked me, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Of course, I said, I would love to be an artist. Um, so my parents, you know, uh, who are West African, and I don't know how well you know West African parents, there's only three things you're allowed to study in, in a West African household. Can any, if, if anyone wants to put in the chat and guess which ones those professions are, um, but none of them are art. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it's either me medicine, um, becoming, uh, becoming a doctor, becoming a lawyer, or some type of an engineer. 
So becoming an architect was my compromise. Now, what I didn't realize is that how many barriers that there were going to exist just in me being able to get into the industry. Um, getting into architecture school just as a start is super difficult. Um, I went to one of the best high schools in, um, is actually, uh, the high school I went to was ranked number one in public schools in the state of New Jersey. It was a really ac academically advanced high school. Um, I had a really great fine arts uh, portfolio, I had a decent GPA, a 3.2 GPA, uh, applied to a lot of really great schools, and I got rejected from every last one of them, including Temple. So, <laughs> but, so I went to Temple um, uh, eventually, but what I realized is that um, for me to actually get into the profession, I would have had to take um, a Saturday course instead of in fine art, but in some type of architecture program and um, work hard in high school to build a portfolio and a career. Now, I think this is a little um, challenging because, you know, at 17, 18 years old, right, my career options, if you ask me what I'd be in, uh, what I wanted to major in, my first choice was art. My second choice was girls. If I could major in girls, that would have been my second choice. At seven, just my thought process at 17. No, most kids have no clue what they wanted to be, what they want to be when they're a teenager. I had to make a hard decision at 18 that I wanted to be an architect, commit to it, create a portfolio, invest the money in programs, try to meet somebody that can guide me along the way and um, just to get into school. And, um, you know, I eventually got into architecture school my second year of college when I reapplied um, for, for Temple's program. But what I realized is that there was a lot, there's a huge lack of role models um, within the industry for people of color just to, you know, shepherd me along. That's why I clung so hard to this organization, to NOMA. Um, now, this, the this third reason, the first and second generation uh, college students, uh, parents that, you know, they, if you come from, uh, you know, uh, a background where your parents just don't have a lot of money, you know, architecture always isn't like, you know, uh, actually doesn't make as much money as other professions either. And I didn't know that at first. I thought it was compromised, but um, I had no idea that, you know, what, what to expect. Um, but then also, uh, again, I didn't hear about architecture until I was a senior in high school. Um, I went to one of the top high schools in the state of New Jersey, um, had a, like, a very good fine arts port portfolio, but yet there were no Saturday courses on architecture in all of New Jersey. There was no advertisement on the major. There was no you know, architects that I knew. There was like nothing around that industry that could teach you know, a kid from Jersey who grew up in the urban part of Jersey City that this profession even existed. And so there's really little knowledge here in terms of how to get in. So what this presentation is about is how do we take people who are dealing with all of these different barriers of getting into, um, I think, one of the most important industries in the world because we shape the built, the built environment. Um, because of us, you know, we pretty much determine what the entire world looks like when you step outside or how you just live. And I think that's a very important role. So how do we shepherd more people into this industry? Now, um, the time that we're going through right now is, is important because, you know, uh, we're, the industry is going through sort of a technological shift. And so I'm going to spend a large part of this presentation talking about what that shift is and how you can adjust. Because anytime an industry is going through a shift, um, especially in technology, it has, it actually removes all the barriers. It's an equalizer. Anytime there's change, everything becomes equal. Uh, so in this, uh, in, in today's age, that major shift is in BIM. Okay. So right now, BIM is an industry that's growing like crazy. It's expected that in the next 10 years, 80% of projects will be done using some form um, of BIM technology. 80%, it has an 18.7% growth rate, all right? So, um, you know, technology in the industry, it's an equalizer. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, 
when new technology comes out and it's a demand of maybe the owner or people who um, you know want you to use it uh, the people who become masters at that technology uh, tend to excel to top positions in industries so it's happened um, so in the dot-com boom um, you know where there are a lot of uh, young kids in their 20s uh, getting rich um, just from websites or creating internet companies like Google and Facebook, um, that was an equalizer. At that time, there were really barely anyone that was under the age of 30 that were millionaires. It just wasn't really heard of. Um, but when the dot-com boom happened, um, it allowed people who were in their 20s and understood technology to step into an industry that nobody knew anything about and to thrive in it and make a ton of money in it. Uh, we're going through the same shifts today with, with social media. You have, um, actually that barrier has actually gone down a lot more where you have people in their late teens and they're making six to seven figure incomes, um, you know, just endorsing products. So this was like five, 10, this is about five years ago when uh, Instagram and a lot of this technology was hot. In today's industry, um, like outside of them, um, the biggest industry, the biggest, the fastest growing industry right now is gaming. Uh, kids right now are making um, six and seven figure incomes playing professional video games. Uh, so the, the people who, and, and so these things, they're equalizers. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't make it matter your background. It, it's the people who are able to step in and master um, that current uh, technology of the time, um, they're the ones who actually excel, um, excel to very, very high, high levels. And so it, it opens up um, sort of a threshold to let a lot of people in that normally wouldn't have been allowed to be in. Okay. Um, and, and I know this from experience because I, I own a company called Revit Gods and it blows my mind what type of projects we're, ever, <laughs> we're a part of. So um, BIM is going through this really huge um, shift. Uh, currently, you know, um, and I'm really gonna break this down for you guys. Currently BIM adoption, um, only 34% of architects actually use some form of BIM model. So um, right now it still feels like um, not a lot of architects are necessarily using, um, you know, some type of BIM software and it could be Revit or, or Vectorworks or Micro, whatever they're using. Um, but there's not a lot of architects yet who have stepped into this um, platform. So. Um, so there's a big opportunity and a big shift. Now, um, I want to help you guys understand why this shift to BIM is actually happening, okay? Now, the first reason why this shift to BIM is happening um, is because, you know, uh, contractors and owners, they're realizing that if they have a 3D model, they can better coordinate systems within industrial healthcare data centers and manufacturing projects, which right now are on a huge upkick data centers are popping up all over and that upkick has almost multiplied because of the pandemic and everyone needing more access to uh, data. Um, so the, the need to coordinate systems is important. Uh, the increase of prefab. Um, prefab right now, uh, I, there's a stat out there, but basically in the next 10 years, 50, over 50% 50 of projects will be prefabrication. The, the shift to how buildings are designed is going to be more of a product focused or product based society first, where you're going to start to spec products earlier in the design process and you'll be putting belt buildings together as if they were Lego pieces. And then, um, cause it's, it, it's supposed to sort of streamline production. So, uh, prefab is on a massive increase. Um, so, and, and this creates the, uh, the need to, in, to define products earlier on in the design process. Um, also, owners are getting a lot smarter. They're realizing that if they have a BIM model, they can use this to streamline facilities um, in asset management and also to streamline future building renovations. Okay, so the, the typical process that, you know, we go through as architects um, or are used to in terms of designing a building has changed. Uh, you know, and, and I wanna talk about what that, uh, what the new process is now 
um, there's like a, a sort of a new building life cycle. So, because if you think about it, right, let's say you get a project today. Um, you know, the first thing that you'll probably need to do with an existing building, um, the first thing you'll need to do is to uh, go to that building or space and survey it. Um, now, I'm really scarred from surveying because uh, working in the industry, um, especially, I only worked in the industry for about five years before I transitioned. So I spent five years of straight up grunt work. Um, I, I, you know, they used to send me to like um, tall uh, 13 story buildings and have me survey the entire thing with a laser measure. And, um, you know, I like working out, but not, not like that, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and it, I think even in that process, of having to hand survey a building, things always came out inaccurate. So the first thing is in today's new building life cycle, um, spaces really are now being laser scanned. Um, this is a, uh, there's been huge shifts in technology to make this easier, um, to allow more people to uh, own the equipment that's, that you need to actually laser scan a space so that you don't have to keep going and, and uh, to do multiple surveys or spend literally a week at a site. Um, then, so if we take it down the process, so you get a, a 3D laser scan, then, in, then you create an um, existing building model, uh, then you run some type of general de design software to help you do a test fit, plan spaces, so once you have an existing model, you're gonna see, all right, how many units can I fit, how many desks can I fit, what can I fit inside of the space, uh, then, once you make, once the client is able to make a decision, they're going to take that information and do some type of 3D visualization. Um, then there'll be some type of dynamo scripting and coding to automate documentation. Once the design is done, the build, the BIM model is done, we're going to automate the construction. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, finally, the, the uh, owner is going to use that BIM model for facilities management um, and asset management. And then uh, we're going to take uh, everything at the end, and the owner will get a chance to use uh, reality capture technology for sales and marketing. Now, uh, I know there's like really like these emoji tools that you can use, but um, give me um, a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up if you studied or have the skills to do any of these things. Okay, all right, couple people. All right. So a couple people. Now, did anyone learn these skills in school when they graduated? Coming out of school, did you learn these skills? Give me another thumbs up. Okay, some people, all right, awesome. Perfect, perfect. All right, so some people. So, so most, um, so in today's world, it's really crazy because uh, it's really difficult to come out of school with the ability to code, the ability to do parametric design, the ability to render, the ability to um, understand and, and track data, uh, the skills that students right now are getting in architecture school and versus what they have to do in their actual careers, there's a, currently a big gap. So, um, you know, so, you know, and to give you an example, right? So I have a project that, you know, we uh, worked on last year, which is, uh, which is the, the Philadelphia Inquirer building, right? So we have this uh, massive uh, building that's on, uh, I think it's on 400 North Broad Street. That's gonna be uh, the new Philadelphia police headquarters. And we were brought in because uh, for whatever reason, the building was um, designed, um, construction documents, the whole thing, and without actually, um, the, the designers for whatever reason never created a, an existing BIM model. So uh, we came in, uh, we, there was a company that had already come, came in to do a 3D laser scan of the building. Now prior, you know, we, in the process, we might have visited the building. Um, I did one single walkthrough of the building. Um, but um, once we had that walkthrough, I understood what was happening. We took this um, laser scan. I sent it to my team. I have a, um, a team of about five to 10 people who work all over the country and some overseas. And uh, without them ever having to visit the building, we can give them a laser scan um, of the building. They could work remotely 
and actually produce an existing building model that the uh, contractors and the subs can coordinate around. Okay, so this was important because in this um, building, which is 100 years old, what we didn't realize or what they didn't realize is one, every column um, is a completely different size and the entire building also slants by 0 0.03 of a degree, which changes everything. It's a big, um, the, the building takes up an entire city block. So, um, so you know, in the, in the building life cycle, you're, you're gonna, you know, do sort of like a 3D scan, then you'll do some type of um, existing BIM model. Um, I just wanna kind of show that, you know, um, yeah, I just wanna kind of show that, you know, th this is sort of some of the, the steps that we're gonna take through designing the building and really where we're gonna uh, fit in. Now, once we get through that, uh, we'll go through some type of generative design process. Now, generative design, um, and this has been sort of a new industry, uh, but generative design is, is pretty awesome because um, it's sort of an industry that looks at being able to put in inputs. Um, so maybe, you know, here's my property line, here's how many units I want, um, and you know, help me to spit out iterations for, you know, what could potentially work. Now, um, this is a huge, huge shift. Because if you think about it, right, um, imagine you were to do a test fit of any multifamily residential project, and maybe it would take your team a week, maybe two weeks, just to figure out um, what, could, what can you actually fit within this envelope, right? So maybe it'll take you two weeks. Now, what generative design does um, is it allow, it actually gives you, um, if you write the script uh, correctly, you can spit out a hundred different iterations within five minutes. This changes everything because a lot of times, you know, if it took me two weeks to create one iteration um, versus I could do a hundred iterations in five minutes, the owner is able to just look at like, you know, kind of narrow down, oh, okay, I think the top 10 here is, is what I like the best. Let's kind of narrow this down. The owner can make a decision a lot faster. And sometimes um, in most projects, you know, uh, without generative design, the, you know, if the owner only got one option or maybe two or three, um, as fast as you're able to work, uh, the owner might, couple months down the line, change his mind. He might realize that the, the money that he wanted to make from the building just isn't working. Uh, he might realize three, four months down the line that, man, he bought the wrong site. Like he bought the wrong plot of land. He should have bought it, you know, maybe down the street where he could make a better return on his investment. And, you know, with the general design, we're able to get that type of data up front and help the owner make better decisions. And, and also giving you as a designer more time to actually design, okay? So um, this is just some where it is. Now, our um, other process in terms of doing 3D visualization, which is pretty cool, is, um, and this is nothing new, but it's just, again, being able to render finishes um, for product selection. Now, I think what's really different um, in today's age is just the ability to, you know, use virtual reality or other immersive technologies to um, real time see what I'm actually designing and being able to bring that client along, um, along the ride with you. Uh, there's also design automation. So this, um, so this is actually a really cool, um, there's a Dynamo script um, that's, that uses data shapes and all it does is it creates a door legend based off of the existing doors in your project. So if you ever try to in Revit, maybe create a door legend, um, you know, it's sort of a manual process, you know, there's scripts now that you can run to pretty much automate documentation, okay? So these are some of the things that the, the technology is supposed to um, be able to help us do. Now, obviously, you know, we, we went through a couple steps here. We um, designed the building, we made, um, you know, we rendered the building. Now we're automating our construction documents. Now we want to coordinate the building. 
this is um, another project that we're uh, actively working on. And um, right now we're doing BIM court, uh, run BIM coordination on a major um, renovation up in um, Trenton, New Jersey for uh, New Jersey's new state capital. But um, like I said, you, you know, in today's age, you, you kind of need to be able to coordinate. And the skill set that you need in this environment is someone who is really skilled at problem solving. Well, actually, you kind of need like a professional Tetris player, like someone who's great at Tetris. <laughs> like I am and uh, you know can figure out how all these systems are gonna fit together and meet with a team of fabricators once a week or maybe two three times a week to figure out how all of this is going to fit okay so these are some pretty big um, shifts um, skills and expertise that's coming um, and then find um, you have construction automation um, you have construction automation where you know you you're pretty much taking um, robots and you're taking the information out of a BIM model, you're inputting it um, into a series of robots that can either drill holes for you, uh, put up assemblies for you. Um, it's a lot safer, a lot quicker, just much more efficient. And this is where the industry is going. And then the last thing um, that, I'm sorry, the two last things I want to talk about is facilities management and asset management. Um, for uh, clients that are putting up buildings now who are sort of managing um, major facilities, they have a lot of products that are going inside of those facilities. Uh, the BIM model, especially specifying products a lot early, earlier, the BIM model at the end is supposed to output data. Um, and this is data that will allow them to know when maybe a filter needs to be changed or when a particular unit needs to be swapped out or it needs to be serviced. Um, so in the facilities and asset, asset management process, we're giving the owner a lot more capabilities um, or a lot more tools with, um, or yeah, more things that they can do with that 3D building model. And the last thing for marketing, which is, I think is dope, and there's so many um, pieces of technology that are able to help us do this, like Matterport, where you can, um, once we're done with the building, uh, we can take in, uh, executable file, send it or post it to our website or send it to a potential client who might want to move into a unit or make a purchase without ever visiting. Okay, so this is where a lot of technology is at right now. And to be quite honest with you, um, there's a big uh, gap in talent in being able to produce um, much of this type of work. Um, you know, even in, in the end, when we talk about data capture, even taking that BIM model and spitting it out to other softwares to help maybe um, developers track monthly income, track usage of a building, um, just be able to track ongoing building performance. So the idea is, you know, and so my goal is to kind of show you guys, here's everything that, you know, this is where the industry is right now. And this is, you know, how people are going through the entire building cycle. There's a lot of skills and talents to, to fit in here. And even if you became a master at just one, it would help you step into any role, any position, any company that you wanted to start. Um, and to be quite honest with you, these are, this is a lot of stuff that the industry quite needs. The biggest point, though, is that, um, and no slack on anyone who's, um, doing the majority of projects in AutoCAD or maybe hand drawing, all I'm saying is that you couldn't do anything, any of this still drawing in 2D. It's just not possible. Okay. And right now, 66% of architects are still producing documents this way. And that is why we're in trouble. So there, there are some um, challenges that we have to overcome. And uh, you know, the one thing that I realized in my research um, and, for, and, and doing all this is that, you know, although, you know, when I was getting into architecture school, it was really hard to get into. Um, I realized that, you know, there were a lot of other kids that would have um, studied architecture. Um, you know, had anyone on this conference, have you ever had someone or met someone and you told them that you're an architect and their first thing is like, oh my gosh, I always wanted to be one. I was just about to study that. 
you know? And maybe that person, that same person works in accounting or they work in engineering or they work in like some other discipline. And what, I, what I'm realizing now is because of how diverse the industry um, has gotten in terms of technology, um, there's a lot of areas where those people who went into other professions can actually come back in. Um, so if you, you know, if you study, if you have a finance background, uh, I don't see why that person who, has, who studies finance can't come back in to help us manage data. Or someone who, um, you know, went to school for some other form of engineering can't come back in to help us just do some BIM coordination earlier on in our design process. And so the point of this is not to tell architects to, hey, you need to learn like 20 other skills. The point of this is you need to let in more people who already have these skills. Okay, and that's the biggest point of what we'd like to achieve. Okay, so, um, so just to reiterate and just to kind of beat this dead horse, or beat this horse until it's dead, or hopefully more diverse, <laughs> you know, uh, here's why architecture needs diversity. The first one is, um, is it's the risk of architecture becoming an endangered profession, right? One of those things, one of those n nostalgic careers, like, you know, where you tell your, your grandkids, like, oh, I used to be a cobbler. What's that? You know, <laughs> you know, hopefully architects aren't the same thing. Man, I'm, you know, your granddaddy was an architect. Really, what, what are those? You know, software architects? No, building architecture. And the reason why, you know, that, that is a very real, uh, uh, a true reality is because contractors are actually taking up the market um, of becoming the new designers. Contractors are actually stepping into the game, um, running up design build contracts, and design build is an industry that's booming right now. Um, and they're understanding Revit, they're understanding all the technology that I just showed you, and all they're doing is stepping into the industry um, to run projects from start to finish, and then hiring sort of like a mix of designers and architects to work, uh, work to, contract the design portion out. But the challenge is, you know, having a party up front that can accept risk and having a party up front that can specify products so that we can streamline it throughout the entire process. Okay. So um, so this is you know really the challenge. And also like I said, this is um, you know just the risk of not being diverse enough outside of technology outside of everything that we need to catch up to, um, you know, again, the, the face of today's owner is changing. And it, it has to be able to address the different needs of what someone is going to be look like, looking at. You know, I run a BIM consulting firm. Um, I stepped away actually designing buildings um, a couple years ago, but I still get phone calls and text messages all the time from people um, who want you know, me or Revit guys to design a building. And they do it just because, you know, I look just like them, <laughs> you know, for no other reason. It has nothing to do with qualifications. So it's just that the faces are changing, okay? Um, and we want to be able to, uh, um, you know, give those people someone who can actually do the work. So, so this is important. We don't want to lose this to, to the construction industry. Now, um, some of the benefits to adapting to new technology, um, you know, right now, 81% of U.S. companies indicate that they actually do look for some form of BIM capability before make, while they're making their selection. Um, so RFPs nowadays are, you know, owners are, start, are really getting hip to it, um, where RFPs are sort of requiring this stuff, um, and it's been sort of a big rise. Um, and architects report... Um, seeing a 20% increase in business development levels just from BIM adoption. Uh, also, there's just reduced production time. It's a, I, I think it's starting to become a known fact that one person doing BIM can produce more than three people using CAD. So there's just an overall jump in productivity that's happening right now. And I think, you know, for the uh, firms that latch onto this, and can do this, this is going to expand the business model of the architecture firm, where we get a chance to spend uh, more time in the virtual design and construction process. We can help owners through the facility management 
um, process, helping them uh, manage data, we earn more per project. Uh, and, you know, it's just understanding that the global uh, forecast for BIM, it's increasing. It's, it's going to be a 3.2, um, I'm sorry, a $7.2 billion industry by within the next two years by 2022. Okay, so there's opportunity um, for this on both sides. So, um, so that is it. I've, I forgot to put in a, a slide in between here for um, any questions, but does anyone have any um, uh, questions, comments? I love to kind of like, um, you know, sort of open this up to so that we can have like a, maybe like a mini discussion. What programs do generative design? Uh, great question. So um, Revit 2021 just came out with a generative design tool built into it. So um, so you can now do generative design inside of Revit. Um, before that, you had to use uh, two, um, basically scripting and coding. You would either have to use um, a series of Dynamo scripts, or you would have to use um, some type of Python shell within Revit um, to be able to do it. So, but it took a lot of scripting and coding. There's other um, third-party uh, platforms that do it. There's a really popular one called TestFit that um, allows you to do, you know, basically, it's general design. They don't call it that, but it's pretty much general design that allows you to kind of generate those calculations. Now, I mean, do you have to write your own script or the script is already written and you just drop your design in the formula and it comes up with different um, options? Uh, Revit 2021 is probably the first interface where it's, or well, one of the first interfaces where it's, user friendly, like you don't have to be a code, coder to know how to use it. So it's, it's um, yeah, so it's a, it's a easy use. It's great, actually. Um, and we've been playing with it, um, you know, at, at a base level, you know, it allows you to figure out furniture arrangement, but um, I really like the tools for just figuring out like unit matrices. I come from a multifamily background, so um, the hardest thing that, that we ever had to do was to try to figure out how to fit a certain number of one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms into a building. And um, I think I think the, the tools are really, to me, great for that. Um, you, Chen, I have a question. Um, what's the best way to apply the Revit way of thinking <clears throat> and documentation and all of that in smaller scale projects. Um, see the benefit, the total benefit in large scale projects where there are a lot of moving parts um, with mechanical systems, building components and all of that. How is it best used for smaller scale projects? Um, I, I guess, that's, so that's a great question. So, um, and, and it's so funny, we, so I have a, a client of mine that asked us the other day to create a, a CAD template for him because um, he was he had a deck replacement that he wanted to do <laughs> and <laughs> and it was only like 50 hours um, that he had access to be able to do it and so I told him I was like and, and mind you you know they're they're contracting us to you know this is a um, I think a 30 plus person firm and we're doing that has landscape architecture and architecture in, in, in house. And we're doing a full BIM implementation. I told, I told him, I was like, look, I'd love to make you a CAD template, but that would totally undermine our process. And, you know, for, so even for a deck replacement, um, it's, it's not necessarily thinking about, do I use Revit on a big project or a little project or medium? Um, that's not really the thought process. It's, more, it's, mostly, um, it, it's, it's mostly just a way of working uh, versus you know, uh, what do I use it for? Um, so, you know, if I'm an oil painter, everything I do is gonna be an oil painting. And, um, you know, so stepping into it, um, even for a smaller project, if you have a really good template, um, just a basic kit of parts, like walls, doors, windows, things that you can just drop in and easily cut sections, elevations, um, and plans, um, I think it could be used for projects of all different types of scale. The, the reason why it's really difficult for people to approach Revit 
um, you know, on a small project is because they don't have those initial, they don't have those tools to, to you know, drop in and, and make a quick thing happen. Look, I mean, I think when I, when I, um, I didn't even have my license yet, and I got the software where it was just all 3D. So I just designed some, I just want to design the whole house just from scratch with 3D. It was awesome. The problem is the time commitment to learn the, 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 the software to get it to the finish. Because um, I, I was saying, I, that was like an endless project. I just kept working on it. <laughs> but in real life, I don't have that much time. And like Spain was, was, uh, hitting, to, was, was hitting that. I wanted to start BIM on everything. I don't care what project it is. It could be a renovation, a, a smart deck, uh, a new construction of a 15-unit building. I want to just do everything in BIM from, from nuts to bolts. The problem is the time crunch. It's the learning curve. I mean, I know how to do BIM because I took a, a class with on it, but to, for me to say what, to get this project started in BIM from, from day one, I know it's going to take way more time than if I could just go ahead and kick it out in CAD. But like you said, you got to start somewhere. And once you start building up those 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 libraries and and windows and standards and rivet, it becomes easier and quicker. But you got to the initial get that ball rolling is hard. Yes. Yeah. It, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Eugene. Yeah. Uh, what I was gonna say was, um, you know, I I think a lot of this stuff is 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 definitely a shift in mindset because you know as a you know, my background started in fine art. And, you know, if I wanted to draw, all I had to do was pick up a pencil and right. get my notebook. It was super easy. And um, I, I didn't really have to do much. Now, if I, if I wanted to do an oil painting, okay, that it took a little bit more preparation. Like I couldn't just pick up oil and put it on a canvas, especially since it takes forever to dry. Um, you know, I had to really think through more steps before I got started. And that's kind of what BIM is. Um, it's just a different drawing tool. And, and with this one, you have to think through a couple more steps and actually have a, a true handle of what your design process is and what your own personal design philosophy is prior to stepping in, which is why a lot of people have trouble with it. Because um, sometimes they don't know. It was like, <laughs> look, I just, I just design. Like, I, you know, I just put pen to paper and, and we go. And, um, you know, you, you do have to take two steps back to take three, three forward. And Murray, I know you have a question, so I'm gonna get to it right after this. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, I guess what I was thinking, are, are there um, methods that you found have been more successful for people like that? And I think I'm in that pool who are more intuitive designers and want to push and pull like, sketch up but can't do it as well or maybe as comfortably in revit um what what would you suggest uh they can do and also too are there shortcuts that you found that people have taken to kind of cross that bridge um so that's a great question um so i found so so the answer to this is not has nothing to do with tech technique or technology, it's just overcoming fear. Um, I found that the, the number one reason um, that I get um, from people uh, stepping into Revit is just overall fear and intimidation of the platform. Um, you know, no one ever taught me Revit. Um, you know, I just opened it and, um, <laughs> and, and, and hit my head until I figured it out. And um, you know, Googled and YouTube the things that I didn't know, and mm -hmm. and that's really where I started to figure it out. So just like any other drawing medium, again, um, you know, you. just in my fine art experience, um, most drawing mediums like oil painting, I didn't know how to do. You know, no one taught me how to be an oil painter. I just kind of figured it out, <laughs> and you know, I did one terrible painting, and then I did a better one, and then I did a better one, and then I did a better one. Um, and after a while, it, you know, it became phenomenal. Gotcha. Uh, so, and, so Murray, you have a question um, that is a good one because you say generative design 
you, you know, it kind of goes through options, um, you know, goes through options um, in, in terms of iterations, but how do you use it as an iterative design tool? Like, yeah, how do we getting, use it? Oh, sorry, right. kind, of, kind of getting to Mike's question again, like, you know, if a client necessarily, if, if, if they're kind of like, you know, they get overwhelmed by five options and only want to see one, but want to kind of, you know, tweak one thing here, how well does BIM kind of work to show that? Uh, so if I understand your question, can you rephrase that in a different way? Sorry. Gotcha. Like more, I guess, process um, based design, like talking through like, you know, what the design should be with the client kind of at the beginning concept of the phases, like is BIM appropriate, like throughout the whole process or more toward the end when things are kind of like finalized and everything like how how can ir iterative design kind of work before kind of like the final design package is done All right, that's a great question so um so this has been actually super difficult for um and i must admit like this this, this has been hard for a lot of um practitioners to wrangle um conceptual design in like stepping into Revit to do conceptual design. And, um, you know, and there are ways to do it. Again, it's, you know, if you're comfortable with the tool, it's, it's really not much of an issue, but, um, but for people who maybe have like, they're really comfortable with other tools. Cause you know, if I'm an oil painter, I don't want you to force one, force you to be one, you know, um, you know, you might sketch it all your painting out first in, in pencil and then move to oil later in the process. Totally fine. So, um, but what Revit's done is, uh, or Autodesk has done, they've come, uh, they've developed more partnerships um, to allow Revit to become um, agnostic, to be able to accept anything. So if you start your process in Rhino, uh, SketchUp, um, any other design program, um, Revit's made it so that you can um, start in any program you want, bring it in at any time you want into Revit, and easily convert that 3D mass or model into a workable Revit file. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, there's a really good integration I will look up, which is the Rhino to Revit integration. It's really um, brand new. Uh, and they just, like, I want to say, like, two months ago worked out. A lot of kinks. Um, you know, I also work with another organization, the Philadelphia Dynamo User Group, and we had an awesome presentation um, that McNeil did on the tool and, and how it works. So if you go to the Philadelphia Dynamo User Group YouTube channel, you can look it up and check it out. Okay, so Ken's question: um, Would I recommend using Revit LT or the full Revit? even for a small firm? Um, so great question, because <laughs> there's a big price difference between the two. <laughs> so, um, you know, Revit LT is obviously the Revit Lite version, and Revit LT, the only thing that's different from the full version is you cannot collaborate um, on projects. So you, Revit LT, two people can't, cannot work in the same project at once. Um, and then they also take away some other uh, important capabilities, which um, are, you know, so it, so I guess, Ken, to answer your question, it just depends on um, whether, it depends on a project. If it's just you working in the, in the project, then I think you get away with it for sure. Uh, but the second you need to collaborate with, with anybody else, you do need to have a full revenue, um, especially if, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I also heard that there's you, it's really no add-ons. You can't really add on to Revit. Like all the add-ons are pretty much for the full version. Like third-party add-ons. Yeah, there's no add-ons, which is also annoying. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So, um, but I yeah. So I think the add-ons, but mostly the collaboration aspect, are, are two really the biggest draws. So it's not. I don't. It's not really about small firm, big firm. It's really about the project and what you want to do with it. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know if anyone has, uh, okay, thanks. 
Thanks, Cephalin, for dropping that into the chat, uh, the differences. Um, you know, I guess one, you know, question, uh, because we've been doing sort of like a lot of research on this topic. And, you know, the reason, and the reason why we're doing a lot of this research too is, um, you know, earlier in the year, uh, especially when all this COVID stuff started happening, um, you know, the racial, like, the, the racial stuff didn't happen yet. Like, I already started this uh, research, but um, I did a, uh, a call, like, a, uh, I submitted to speak at a conference, an AIA conference in South Carolina that had a really interesting kick. And they wanted someone to come down and talk, give this exact same presentation, talk about diversity and how to increase it, which is what started the research on this topic. And, um, you know, I realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 industry does lack a lot of diversity, but it also, you know, is really behind technologically and um, it's, all, it's, it's almost on the brink of extinction. Um, and I guess, I guess my question is, you know, how do you guys feel about that? Is, is that, you know, are, am I, you know, sort of off base, you know, with a lot of these things and, you know, does, does it sort of encourage any feelings to, to maybe want to change or do something differently? Well, I mean, I don't know, uh, Ian Smith, I don't know if he's listening or he just logged on, but I like to hear what he has to say about, uh, uh, about that topic. Like I told you before, me, I'm, I'm a small person. I mean, not small, person. I'm small firm, pretty much one man. I hire my uh, consultants when I need to. I hire my um, drafters when I need to. But like I said, I want to get to a point where all my projects start in Rivet. I do have Rivet Lite. That's why I asked you that question. Um, I don't know if I, if I just need to bite the bullet and go ahead and buy the full version. But I don't want to buy a full version and not use the full capabilities of it, understand? Because the learning curve. So if I got light and I could start in light with all the projects, and then after a while, I'll be like, you know what? I think I'm good at this. I need to get to um, pull the trigger on the full version. If I can get these other um, aspects, especially the add-ons. I think the add-ons add are like amazing. Yeah, you can't do without the add-ons. Um, but you, you were asking me to like chime in. Is this about the uh, the diversity component and how how we can better solve that problem? Um, yeah, I, yeah. You know, just just in terms of where the industry is going, because I don't know if this this you know information is common knowledge. I think I think you're basically touching on a lot of things with regard to them, right? I think the you could easily substitute that term as automation, basically, right? All business. In order to make money and to sort of be productive, you're trying to automate. So you're taking your systems, shrinking them down into ways that basically use less man hours in order to produce the products, right? It's the, the quintessential model of industrial industrialization, right? Or manufacturing. So basically, AI, which is what we're doing, we're building these technologies to build knowledge bases to create sequences that basically remove humans from the, from the, um, the equation, which is really what's happening. I mean, like AutoCAD did it, you know, um, in its phase and, and Revit's doing it in this phase. You can, you can basically use less people to produce a building, generally speaking. Three to one in, is a is relation to your um, uh, research. So my thing is, is that when you increasingly reduce the amount of people that are working on something, you're either taking the institutional knowledge and putting it somewhere else. So putting it on someone else's machine, right, computer, or you're putting it in fewer people. And that means how do you compartmentalize that task and how do you bring people into that process? Like it, it's growing, there's, in some ways it, there's growing, there'll be growing difficulty for putting in the, the most essential knowledge to the people that um, you know, have that power. And that means that if you're trying to diversify the, the uh, profession, you're going to be compartmentalizing the tasks into more or less like associate degree kind of templates, right? You're not going to be a professional and need a license. You're just going to be a drafts person, right? Or you're going to be 
a data com, you know compiler or you're going to need or you're going to be someone who goes and gets the 3d scan and translates it into documentation um that's what's going to happen right you can see it already i mean it's kind of existing in its in itself so the question is do you need a master's degree to be an architect right no but you probably do need a master's degree to go generate business and to and to and to sell right to be a seller doer right and that in of itself requires persuasive skills linguistic skills writing skills math skills right so if you decide you want to use less math and not have to have it in your head yeah just use the computer let the computer do it for you but i guarantee you most of the people that are at the high levels are come you know are, are having all that stuff together in the same place at the same time and making decisions so your your top professionals are going to be saying oh yeah we know how to put in you know how many three bedroom units two bedroom units one bedroom units in that because we've done it already it's in my head right we don't have to go to a computer to figure that out to make the sale but to do the iterations afterwards absolutely use the computer you just get people to the table with your hopefully immense amount of um, experience that you bring to the table. Um, I, that's my, uh, so it's, it's going to be difficult, but if we're going to bring people in and give them jobs doing technical things, they are going to make money early on. I would agree with that. That's my take. Awesome. That is phenomenal. Mike. Phenomenal Mike. response. Yeah, Mike. Okay. What, what I, the problem I have is like this, 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 quick, oh, this is all the designs that could come out from that because based on your space. What do you think about that being like uh, somebody who likes to like really design and have high design standards? I mean, can a machine do that? So, or it, it can, I, I think it can give you those iterations quickly because actually when you tend to pull that up, um, there, 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 there are occasions where I'm doing like I'll call a planning exercise more than a design exercise. Like just recently, we were looking at this lot for a client who wanted residential and retail commercial on the site, right? And how many cars can I get in per units, per retail square footage, parking that I need? And I needed to do that fairly quickly. So old school way for me is getting the basic blocks, drawing them, tracing, and doing these things like that. When I saw what you should have had on the screen, I could have did all of that in one day, where it probably took me two and a half days to get that out of my head, on the paper, figured it out, and be able to present it. So in that sense, Ken, yeah, it works. But to the other side, I'm more intuitively inclined to work in, in SketchUp to me is an electronic pencil. Um, and I'm able to more quickly in a digital fashion, look at volumes and stuff like that, where Revit, one, because of what you Chenna said, I must admit, is some fear of getting to that platform and trying to master that in some way. Um, so I can do those iterations if I want to and invent a script that allows me to do those other design thinky things in, in Revit. I do think though, at least from what I can tell, because I'm not really Revit savvy at all, it's not as intuitive to make those changes at the speed of thought without, as you said, Utena, taking two steps back and thinking about how you want to apply it. And that's, that's the challenge I think myself and people may that have the process like me face. Does that give you some insight, Ken? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can um, definitely agree with, I, I, I can agree with that. I think the uh, making changes at the speed of thought, um, because what Revit does great is it deals with the change after you've come up, after you've right. generated. Right, right, right. You know, um, so, but the gap is how quickly can I produce that change and reflect? Um, I think to Murray's question, um, he's asking, can automation be innovative? And in, in my opinion, I don't think, auto, I, I don't think it can, um, I don't think automation can be innovative. I just think it gives you more time to be innovative. 
Um, so to Mike's point, if it's removing, you know, a day and a half worth of work uh, to come up with um, a design decision, I think that, you know, Mike has earned two days to really flesh out that decision and um, to better design it, to better detail it, um, you know, to, to do all those things that, you know, you normally uh, under a, um, your contract, you wouldn't have time to do, <laughs> you know? And so I think, um, you know, I, I don't think it's a, it's a uh, you know, necessarily, uh, depending on what type of designer you are, I don't think it necessarily takes away. I think it, it does add a lot to the process because um, the money that's saved, I think, can actually contribute towards having better designs. To chime in on Uchema's point, one thing that I found fascinating is, is I think that artificial intelligence or generative design is seen as competition or seen as, you know, is this going to be the creator like y'all are saying, but in all reality, you can just think of it as a glorified admin. You know, it, it, can do, it can do your contract documents. It can, do, it can do all the minor parts of it, which removes all these tedious, cumbersome activities from you. So these hours are given back to you to become the creator. You know, I, I don't think any of us in this industry want automation to be innovative. We want to be the innovators. We just want the time to be the innovators. And, and a lot of these BIM plugins or even like scan to BIM, like you were talking about, it, it just gives you that time to truly innovate with, you know, the Revit admin. I think, I think the one thing we're missing is that AutoCAD's already short in the timeline. The expectations on delivery is, is basically one sixteenth of the time it used to be. Right. And we're fighting that constantly. Exactly. So, you know, people are just going to want more fast. Exactly. Exactly. They're going to want more faster. I don't, I don't know if they're really going to give us any they, kudos. They're going to make more money. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to basically say we want it for cheaper because you can deliver it cheaper. You're not doing as much. So you're going to have to do twice as much. So, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> literally speaking, that's where it's headed. You know, yeah, we're going to be racing to the point. bottom. With yeah, exactly. I, I don't see it making us have more free time to freely design. I just don't see that. Well, well, I, what, see, I see a client saying, oh, yeah, if it was last year, you could do it in five days. But now they got this new technology out. You could do it in two days. I'm paying you two days worth of work. Well, get it done. That's it. Thing with that, and I think this is where we as a profession and also that perspective and you tend to maybe you, you can chime in here. I don't, I'm not sure what you're finding and seeing. If I as uh, an architect can provide to you my client developer or whatever the information that you need sooner than you would generally get it. That gives you the opportunity to make decisions quicker, make more money, make smarter decisions. So I want you to pay me for the value that I'm giving you by being able to do it five days quicker than my competitors or what you've been used to because I'm worth it. That's part of the strategy I think we have to start to take. Well, and you're right. It happens in the beginning. It happens in the beginning until what? everyone adopts the technology. Exactly. Everybody right. got it. Everybody got the same technology. I mean, everybody has the right. same technology. There's nothing so, that, you, so, that, you, that the other person don't got. Right. So you have to figure out how you, how you play that game. It, it can be a, a blessing or a curse. Try to make it as much as a, of a blessing as you can. And, you know, I've also found in some cases that although they're rare, these developers and, and, and guys that do the larger projects that are looking for a return are smart business people. If you can convince them that you're also a smart business person and this is a smart decision for you to pay me that little bit more that will give you 50% more in your pocket, they appreciate your, uh, your, your, your goals and being, okay, I'm a smart business person also that's what you should give me because of the value I present. Rare occasions, I've seen some that respect that. Um, but I think, again, as a profession, we might need to push that a little bit harder for it to be across the board. Um, so Mike, I, so just, I, I think the last thing I, I wanna kind of close with, um, and so just to kind of share what I am seeing, 
uh, and, and really the point of a lot of this. So what I've learned over years is that business operates, um, all industries operate on what they call an S-curve. And um, so if you draw it out, it's like something like this where um, you, know, you have a technology that comes out. So this is the birth of it. Um, this is where a lot of people um, are in it. They're figuring it out. And then um, this stage here is where it's going through some type of massive growth. Um, then around here is where um, you know, uh, people, everyone's kind of used to it. They know what it is. <laughs> and, you know, um, and it starts to like die off. Um, and what happens after this is that typically um, there's another, uh, another industry comes out and it replaces and there's another S-curve. And so uh, what I figured out, you know, um, when, I'm, when I started this conversation with, because Ian actually is right, um, you know, when everyone's doing it, it will become more of an expectation, but that expectation won't come until around this phase of that S-curve. Right now, we're still around here, uh, where, um, or maybe a little higher, we're, we're still at the bottom of the S-curve, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to um, get in, to, you know, the people who can master it, um, do it, learn it, um, actually have a very unique opportunity to um, you know, gain a mix of clientele, um, and it's up to you as a business owner to negotiate the relationship and the agreements and, you know, how you decide to uh, work with them long term. But it's right here you're going to capture the market. And um, because someone else has already figured it out for you, you just need to figure out what they figured out and learn how to implement it and then, and then ride that growth wave until something new something else new comes out. And so, um, so, that, so that's kind of, you know, the, the trend that I'm seeing. And as I work with, you know, other, especially larger companies, um, you know, they're, uh, without like not naming any companies, <laughs> uh, the, they're, they're at the beginning. They're honestly, they're right here. They're, you know, most of these companies and, and the clients that I'm working with, they're just, uh, more so on the owner side, they're just getting BIM managers. They're just understanding what this stuff is. And um, they have no clue yet what to do with it or um, how, you know, how, what, it, what it really means yet. But I would say we're still probably five to 10 years before they figure it out. I, I got, I, what I'm seeing is, um, as a small firm, I see the clients, they, they expect a 3D rendering. That's what they expect. I mean, I don't know that's as far as you, as you saying that the, the, the it goes, but clients, I don't care how small they are, they expect 3D renderings and they pretty much expect it to come from the architect and it's in their cost. And you talking about, oh, it's going to cost extra for 3D rendering. They're looking at you cross, cross eye. Like really? So I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Um, can just just um, you know, get Lumi, get not Lumion, get Enscape. It'll do the rendering for you in a minute. <laughs> so you you know um, you're right. I mean, because what they expect the rendering looks cartoonish. So I mean, that's to them that's good enough. You don't have to be like the realistic renderings that architect is back to it. Well, Lumion and Enscape are both like hyper real-time renderers, render engines, right? So they're there and, and guess what? If you look at the competitions coming in every day of the week, I, know, I don't know if anyone else gets solicitations, but people are offering $250 per rendering starting off, right? And where it used to be where you could, you know, you could basically charge 10 grand rendering yeah can't do that anymore you might get 750 yeah 
uh, which is why I have I will never put renderings on anymore. Man, that anymore. changes the game, man. That's, that goes to what you're saying, Ian. Once everybody kind of like catches up, it's like, okay, well, you know, I can go to the other guy now that can do it just as well, and they're doing it a little bit cheaper than everybody had. And then there's that baseline now that's that's there. Um, but as you said before, there's a value proposition. You can learn how to do right. your animations. You can learn how to do other aspects, you know, motion graphics, the whole uh, marketing package, video reels, you name it. You just have to learn it, right? And sort of pull that together. Um, last thing, um, and then we'll be done for tonight. So uh, Yvonne, you're, you're, you're definitely uh, totally right that virtual reality will be soon the standard. Um, there's a company called Unity, which is a video game company that um, I believe in the last two years just created a, uh, a partnership with Autodesk. And um, so it's, so a lot of the technology is not necessarily to, because I, I think you know, what, what we're finding is that you know, most people don't want to put a headset on their head. <laughs> you know, they just don't, either don't want to ruin their hair and, and especially in today's world, you know, like, you know, you probably have to spray it down with disinfectant before <laughs> you put you know, a random headset on. Um, but, uh, but what we are seeing are, especially in construction coordination, um, you know, people are really comfortable with a video game controller. Like I have one here. Keep an Xbox controller on me almost all the time because it's more comfortable to fly through models with this than with a mouse. And um, what game designers are doing is they're making it easier to um, take your Revit model and turn it into a video game where it, it is a real immersive experience and can, um, you know, uh, expedite the decision-making process. So um, thanks Stefan for dropping in. You've been like awesome with the links. So, um, but yeah, that uh, guys, this is, this is it. Thank you so much for hopping on tonight. I think it was incredible.